Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and this is Unit 3 of uh, Pearson Edexcel uh, International AS. Uh, this is the paper that was on January 2023. So let's take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. Uh, the question says, a student is asked to identify an organic liquid, P, and an inorganic solid, Q. So, what is he telling me about P? P has molecular formula, C6H12. P is a straight chain molecule that contains one functional group. Bromine water is decolorized when shaken with P. So identify the functional group. What kind of functional group decolorizes bromine water? Of course, that means that I have a double bond between carbon atoms or I have an alkene. Now, what is the name? He says, give a possible name for this compound. He tells me it is C6H12 and it is an alkene. So that is an alkene with six carbons. It is hexene. Q is a group one halide, which produces a lilac color in a flame test. Now, which group one metal iron produces lilac? Remember that lilac is produced by potassium ions. So that means that I have K plus or potassium ion. When a few drops of dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate is added to the solution, a yellow precipitate is formed. Now, you know that nitric acid and silver nitrate is test for what? It's test for halides, chloride, bromide, iodide. And you should know that with chloride, it gives white precipitate, bromide, it gives cream, and it gives a yellow precipitate with what? He said he got a yellow precipitate. That means I have iodide ion, and that means Q is potassium iodide. When a few drops of dilute bromine water are added to an aqueous solution of Q, which we already decided is potassium iodide, a reddish-brown solution is formed. And he's saying, give an ionic equation, including state symbols. So we're reacting bromine water, so that means bromine aqueous, with an iodide, of course, bromine will displace the iodide, so I get a round, red brown solution because I will end up with iodine aqueous. Remember, he wants an ionic equation, so the K plus cancels before and after the acid. A portion of the organic liquid P is added to the red brown aqueous solution formed in C. So we're adding the organic liquid. P, which we call this hexene, which we found was hexene, we're adding it to a reddish brown solution of the iodine that we got, the iodine solution that we got. Of course, if we have an alkene and we um, react it with iodine solution, you have to remember that the iodine solution is aqueous, a liquid, the organic layer will float on top of the water, and the uh, organic layer will turn from colorless to purple because the iodine will dissolve in the organic layer. And remember that iodine in organic layer has a purple or violet color. And the lower layer, which was the reddish brown solution of iodine, now it turns from the reddish brown to colorless. Question two says, in an experiment to measure the entropy change of combustion of ethanol, a student uses this apparatus. And he has uh, water in a beaker with a thermometer and a stirrer, and they are being heated by a spirit burner containing ethanol. And he has a shield around all of this apparatus. So he's saying, give a reason why it's important to shield the apparatus. Of course, we put a shield around uh, this kind of setup so that there is less loss of heat to the surrounding. Draw a hazard symbol which should be on a bottle of ethanol. You should know that ethanol is flammable. 
So we want the hazard symbol for flammable. So that would be this kind of uh, symbol. A student devised the procedure shown to determine the entropy change of combustion for ethanol. So he put 150 centimeter cubed of water in a beaker and its temperature recorded. The burner containing ethanol is weighed, placed under the beaker of water and lit. After five minutes, so he left it to heat the water for five minutes, the burner is removed, the temperature of the water is recorded, the flame is extinguished, and the burner and its contents are reweighed. These are the student's results, and he says complete the table. So what do we have? We have final temperature of water was 29.1. Initial temperature of water was 21.8, so the temperature change is the difference between them. So just subtract them, that comes out to be 7.3. Then he has mass of burner plus ethanol before burning. Mass of burner plus ethanol after burning. So what would be the mass of ethanol burned? Also the subtraction of this or the difference between them. So this is the mass of ethanol that was burned. Then he says, calculate the entropy change of combustion of ethanol using the student's results. Give your answer to an appropriate number of significant figures, and of course, entropy change, you need a sign. And he's giving me the specific heat capacity of water is 4.18. Density of water is 1. Molar mass of ethanol is 46. How do we calculate entropy change of combustion? The first thing we do is we need to calculate the quantity of heat. And you know that the quantity of heat is mc delta t. What is m? You should realize that m is the mass of water. And since the density of water is 1, the volume of water is the same as the mass. So when he says I used 150 centimeter cubed of water, that means the mass of water is 150. And then we have C. C, he gives me 4.18. That's the specific heat capacity. And delta T is the temperature change from the table that was 7.3. So now I can calculate Q. Q from this equation comes out in joules. Usually we divide by 1,000 and change it to kilojoules. Then I need delta H. How do we get delta H? You should know that delta H is Q over N, number of moles. So, the number of moles, how do I get number of moles? From the mass and the molar mass. Number of moles of ethanol would be the mass that we got from the table over the molar mass, which he gives me. So, this gives me the number of moles of ethanol. I can use that to calculate delta H. Delta H is Q over N. So divide the quantity of heat that we got, 4.577, over the number of moles. This gives me the delta H. Remember that this has to be with a sign. Why did we decide that it is a minus? Remember that delta H is negative for exothermic reactions in which there is a rise in temperature. This is entropy change of combustion. You should realize that combustion is exothermic and if you look at the table you will find that the temperature uh, went up so that means delta h is negative in this procedure after removing the burner there is a delay before the flame is extinguished explain the effect of this delay on the value of the enthalpy change of combustion of ethanol determined in the experiment so he's saying that he took the final temperature from the thermometer. He removed the Bunsen burner or the spirit burner, actually. But there was a delay before the flame is extinguished. He was supposed to extinguish the flame immediately so that we can measure the final mass of the spirit burner in order to get the mass of ethanol that was actually used to heat the water. So explain the effect of this delay. Remember that the mass of ethanol calculated will be higher than actually used. So the enthalpy change that we calculate will be a lower number. It will be less exothermic.
the uncertainty in each reading of the thermometer was plus or minus 0.1. Calculate the percentage uncertainty in the temperature change in the student's experiment. The temperature change was 7.3. And remember that we measure in this experiment, we use the thermometer twice. We measure the initial temperature and the final temperature. So the percentage uncertainty will be 2 times the 0.1 over the temperature change times 100. This gives you the percentage uncertainty. The student repeated the experiment using the same apparatus in an attempt to improve its accuracy. The water was heated for 15 minutes before measuring the final temperature. Uh, so this is much longer than the first time. Remember the first time he heated it only for five minutes. The data book value for the standard enthalpy change of combustion of ethanol is minus 1,367. The teacher said that the changes would improve the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of mass and temperature but have little effect on the accuracy of the value obtained. First, he's asking, state how the changes in the experiment improve the percentage uncertainty in the measurement of mass and temperature. So if we're repeating it again, that means that the mass of ethanol burned will have a less percentage uncertainty. Then he says, explain how the difference between uncertainty and accuracy led the teacher to make this statement. Remember, all he did was the student repeated the experiment using the same apparatus. So the teacher says that these changes would improve percentage uncertainty. That is correct. Remember, what is the difference between percentage uncertainty and accuracy? When we have different values, if we repeat it using the same apparatus, then the percent uncertainty is less. That means we have a good precision. Do you understand? Precision means all my values will be near to each other. But that doesn't uh, necessarily mean that they are actually accurate. Accurate means they have to have the same value as the data uh, booklet. So, in this case, there will be less uncertainty or more precision in the results because I repeated it and took the average, since uncertainty indicates the range over which the result is valid. This will not improve the accuracy because all my readings could be near to each other and the average is, has lower uncertainty, but it is not actually the same as the accurate uh, data booklet since we're using the same apparatus. So the difference between the result and the actual data value will be the same. Question three is talking about citric acid. He's saying it is used as a descaler to remove lime scale from kettles and coffee machines. Uh, students determine the concentration of citric acid descaler labeled solution A. So our original solution of citric acid is called solution A. And it had a stated concentration of 200 grams per decimeter cubed. So this is what they wrote on the label, for example. Solution A was diluted by a factor of 10 and then used in a titration with a solution of sodium hydroxide of this concentration. So, using a pipette, he took 25 centimeter cubed of solution A, transferred it to a 250 centimeter cubed volumetric flask. You know what's a volumetric flask? The solution was then made up to the mark with deionized water, inverted several times, and this was labeled solution B. So, solution B is the diluted solution A. Then a clean pipette was used to transfer 25 centimeter cubed of the solution in the volumetric flask to a conical flask. A few drops of phenolphthalein indicator were added to the conical flask and the contents titrated with sodium hydroxide solution. This step was repeated until concordant results were obtained. 
So in step one, the student rinse both the pipette and the volumetric flask with water before transferring 25 centimeter cubed of solution A. State the effect, if any, of these changes in the procedure on the concentration of solution B. So if I rinse the pipette with water and then I just fill it up and put it into the volumetric flask, this is not correct. Remember, we use a pipette. You need to wash it with water and then wash it with the solution that you're going to fill it with. Otherwise, the concentration that you're calculating will be lower than it should be. We are using something with more water in it, and that means my, my co concentration will be lower. But the volumetric flask, if it already has some water in it, that doesn't really make any difference because we are already going to add water to it to the mark. We, once we've transferred the 25 centimeter cubed of solution A into the volumetric flask, then we're going to add water anyway. So it doesn't make a difference if the volumetric flask originally had a little bit of water. Give a reason why the student inverted the volumetric flask several times. When we use a volumetric flask, we fill it with water or we add water to the mark and then we have to close it and invert it several times. This is just to mix the solution so that all the solution is the same concentration throughout. The sodium hydroxide solution was labeled with this hazard label. The student wore safety glasses, placed the burette below head height while filling it with sodium hydroxide. Why is the student taking all of these precautions? So the first question we're going to ask ourselves, what does this hazard label indicate? This represents something that is an irritant. So he's doing all of this to ensure that the solution does not splash into his eyes since the solution is an irritant. State the color change of phenolphthalein indicator at the end point of the titration. So the first thing I'm going to ask myself, what did I have in the flask and what am I titrating? In the flask, we had citric acid. With the indicator, we started with acid and we were adding sodium hydroxide from a burette. And that means that originally my solution was colorless. At the end point, I stop at the first drop that turns permanent pink. The results of the student's experiment are shown. Complete the table, calculate the mean titer. Complete the table. First, for trial two, you have final volume, initial volume. You subtract them to get the volume added for trial two and trial three. And then he wants the mean. How do we get the mean? When we look at all of these trials, we need to decide which of these are concordant values. We said before that concordant means they are within 0.2 of each other. So obviously that first trial is way off from the rest. All the others are concordant, so all the others will be added, divide by their total number. This gives me the average title. So that means that my average is 28.80 centimeter cubed. Give a reason why the student did not need to carry out titrations three and four. Actually, the student should have stopped after experiment two he did not have to go on and do titration three and four because already titrations one and two are concordant, so he could have stopped there. Give a reason why solution A was diluted before titrating it with this sodium hydroxide solution. Remember, we took solution A, we titrated it, uh, we diluted it 10 times, and then we titrated. And when we titrated, we needed about 28.8 from the burette. So if we hadn't diluted it, we would have needed more than that. And that means we would have gone above 50 centimeter cubed or more than 50 centimeter cubed, and the burette goes only to 50. So the solution originally was too concentrated 
the values of the titer, if we had done the titration of the original solution without dilution, then the results would have been much higher than the 50 centimeter cube that can be uh, taken in by the Dura. The unbalanced equation for the reaction between citric acid and sodium hydroxide is shown. Complete the equation, so we need to balance. Obviously, we have three sodiums after the arrow, so you need three sodiums. And if you take a look at the hydrogens, you will need three H2Os also to balance. Calculate the concentration of citric acid in A using the equation from B1 and the results from AV. Give your answer to three significant figures. Okay, let's go back and see what happened. We um, balanced the equation and we found that one mole of the acid reacts with three moles of sodium hydroxide. And we got that the average titer, that is the volume of sodium hydroxide used, was 28.8. So I have the volume of sodium hydroxide, I have the concentration of sodium hydroxide, so the first thing that I do is get the number of moles, concentration times volume, and of course the volume is divided by 1000 before we put it into the equation, so this gives me number of moles of sodium hydroxide. Then we look at the equation and we relate that to the number of moles of citric acid. We said from the equation, one mole of the acid reacts with three moles of sodium hydroxide. That means number of moles of acid is the moles of sodium hydroxide divided by three. This gives me the number of moles of acid. Now, what is he looking for? He's looking for concentration. He said a clean pipette was used to transfer 25 centimeter cube portion of solution B. So that is the volume of solution B. Concentration will be number of moles over volume in decimeter cubed. And this gives me the concentration of the diluted solution. But this was A diluted 10 times. So that means the concentration in A would be 10 times that concentration of B. So this gives me the concentration of A. But this is in mole per decimeter cube. He's asking for it in what? In grams, so I need to change this to mass. Mass is number of moles times mR. This gives me the mass. But this is not the final answer. Because he says what? Give your answer to three significant figures. Please pay attention to all the parts of the question. So first, he wants the concentration in grams per decimeter cube. So I need to get the mass for that number of moles. And I need to put it in three significant figures. So my answer is not 196.85, it is 197. And please round up the numbers correctly. Using the result of the experiment, the student concluded that the stated concentration of the descaler was incorrect. So the stated concentration was 200. We got it 197. State whether or not this difference in concentration would affect the use of the descaler solution to remove lime scale in kettles and coffee machines. So the fact that it is 197 instead of 200, would that make a difference? Of course not. So there is no difference in effectiveness because they're almost the same. So obviously they rounded up the number to uh, a whole number. Since the measured concentration is almost the same, as the stated concentration, so it doesn't make a difference. It will be effective anyway. Question four talks about alcohols K, L, and M, and he's telling me that they are isomers of butane one all. So all of these have C four H nine O H, and they are isomers of butane one all. So they are not butane one. Give a chemical test with the expected result, which would show the presence of OH group in any alcohol. What is the test for alcohols? You should know that tests for alcohols add PCL5, phosphorus pentachloride, and we get misty fumes because this gives out HCl fumes. A sample of butane one all is warmed with a solution of potassium dichromate. 
you should know that potassium dichromate is an oxidizing agent and we use it to oxidize alcohols so if i react potassium dichromate with an alcohol like butane one all what would be the color change you should know potassium dichromate originally is orange when it reacts as an oxidizing agent it oxidizes the alcohol so it turns from orange to green it becomes reduced the three isomers kl and m are warmed separately with portions of potassium dichromate he tells me no color change is observed with k remember which type of alcohol cannot be oxidized if i say that i have an alcohol and it cannot be oxidized that means it is a tertiary alcohol so the tertiary butyl alcohol that is what i have the name is 2-methylpropane-2-ol so this is a tertiary alcohol that would not be oxidized by potassium dichromate then he says the other isomers l and m are oxidized with uh, when warmed with a solution of potassium dichromate that means that l and m are either primary or secondary alcohol and remember that we said it is isomers of butane one all so they are primary or secondary that are other than butane one all so what would be the structure let's see m first because he gave me the structure of the oxidation product when you oxidize M. So obviously when we oxidized M, we got this aldehyde. And that means that my original isomer was what? Was a primary alcohol at that point. It has a branch as, as he draws it. So this is the uh, structure of the isomer which will give me that oxidation product. So what could L be then? Then L could be the secondary alcohol in the straight chain so that when we oxidize it, it gives us the ketone. Okay? Give one chemical test with the expected results which would distinguish between L and M. So remember that L was, the oxidation product of L was a ketone and that of M was an aldehyde. So the question is, how do we distinguish between aldehydes and ketones? You should remember that we add Fehling solution or Benedict solution and heat for the ketone, the oxidation product of L was a ketone. The ketone will give no reaction with Fehlings or Benedicts. And that means the solution remains blue, but the oxidation product of M was an aldehyde, so it will react and give a brick red precipitate. Okay, that's the end of this paper. Thank you for listening, and please keep listening to me.